Anyone who watches this program regularly knows that I have a problem with the narrative of generational war. And I have a problem with it for a lot of reasons, including the fact that I think it's being used to distract younger people from the forces that are really uh, causing them to suffer economically. But uh, uh, there are multiple dimensions to my feelings about this. And my next guest uh, captured one of them perfectly, and he did so from the other side of this supposed generational divide. Keith Spencer, Keith A. Spencer, writes on uh, technology, science, culture. Uh, he's an essayist. He's also an editor at Salon.com, uh, managing the, uh, the science and tech content there. And uh, he has a new book out, which we will also talk about, called A People's History of uh, the Silicon Valley, How the Tech Industry Exploits Workers, Erodes Privacy, and Undermines Democracy. It's a really good book. I'm reading it now. Uh, but let's start by talking about uh, millennials and boomers. So first of all, Keith, welcome back to the program. Thanks. Yeah, great to be here, RJ. And secondly, uh, you know, I, I, I love this piece for a variety of reasons. I was looking forward to talking to you about it. Uh, what, I don't want to summarize your piece for you. What was your main thesis or point here? Yeah, so um, basically I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a really popular narrative that you see a lot in media um, about there being the supposed divide generational divide specifically between millennials and um, baby boomers. Um, sometimes you see other generations talked about too, but it's mostly this millennials versus baby boomers thing. Um, and I, I'm sure, you know, a lot of it is sort of sensationalized by the media. I want to get clicks because it gets, it gets clicks to talk about this. But, uh, you know, there's also a lot of just sort of organically generated memes and jokes on Twitter, you know, mostly slung by millennials because they're you know, younger people are more active and have more social media accounts. Um, jokes and memes and stuff shared by them kind of like making fun of boomers and making fun of um, boomer generation. And so um, I was inspired to write this article because, I mean, I think that the history of um, progressive movements in the left in the United States uh, kind of owes a lot to the baby boomer generation. I mean, they were, um, you know, like I, I, I think the, the emergence of the new left um, in the 60s, which was, you know, mostly uh, comprised of, of boomers being involved in some really radical left movements and um, organized, different different allied organized progressive movements like SDS and the American Indian Movement and Black Panthers and the Young Lords and such. Um, I mean, there's this entire history of kind of radicalism and activism uh, that baby boomers kind of initiated that is sort of excluded from this narrative like I think it which is so basically I think it's wrong to, to castigate all boomers as just kind of you know conservative or stodgy or uh, you know like entrenched in their own economic interests or something like that um, and so I, I you know I, I wanted to write a piece kind of like that went a little bit into the history and the, the, the way of thinking that boomers a lot of boomers not all boomers of course but a lot of boomers particularly those that were you know hippies or on the left or progressive to some degree uh, they're, they're kind of the way that they thought, their ideologies. Um, and so the, the article specifically, part of it was, was triggered by, you know, my, my family, um, my parents are boomers, uh, like most millennials. Um, but my whole, my family is sort of, you know, I, they were kind of like California liberals and lefties going back a few generations. And, um, uh, my grandfather particularly was in, was involved in something that was called the, um, the, the mid peninsula free university. There's this big you, this big movement of what were called free schools in the United States that probably, you know, some people, some of your listeners and watchers probably know about, uh, which is kind of like this this um, this movement for people to sort of uh, community members to start their own schools and teach like decentralize the way that knowledge uh, was was taught or and what even redefine what knowledge was and so. Um, the, it's it's interesting looking back at these kind of archives to to understand the kind of really different ways of thinking about the world, the very radical and utopianist thinking that a lot of boomers had, which I think has been really lost among members of my generation. Like we're super, we're very cynical, uh, we're we're 
you know, relatively narcissistic, but that, that tends to be stoked by social media companies. It's not, you know, specifically our fault as our social forces, technological forces around us. Um, but that's, yeah, so that's, that's basically the gist of, the gist of it, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's super interesting to me, uh, Keith, to see you read about it from a, a millennial perspective, because obviously I come at it from a boomer perspective, and yeah. obvious if you can see me, if you're not listening by radio, anyway. And, um, you know, I remember some of the times you talk about my, because of my age, I was not in the heart of the sort of student rebellion, yeah. late sixties college student thing, but I was right behind it. You know, I was, yeah. uh, I like my older brother was one of the founding members of the Yippies close to Abby Hoffman and, and he's written about that. And, uh, but I was, uh, you know, kind of a few years behind it. I did participate in the student strike in high school, but, uh, yeah. and a lot of demonstrations and things like that. But what I remember about those days was that there was, uh, among a lot of us, and uh, like I said, by the time I got to college, it was already sort of petering out, but uh, there was definitely a sense, a very broad sense of possibility. Yeah, and, right. it, and it, uh, it was infectious, and I think it was important. I think it's something that's starting to come back. I'm starting to yeah. see something like it return in the political and cultural front, but ev it, it, for a few years there, everybody was magnetized to the possibility of radical change, this merge, or, or merge of rock music, and I was a musician also, but right. this, uh, of rock music and political revolutionary thinking and the idea that we could really transform society. And then I remember it fading away so that by the time, for example, of the late 70s, when mm -hmm. Elvis Costello could sing, the, or early 80s, when Elvis Costello could sing the song he didn't write, What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, and that was kind of semi-ironic, semi-not, of like, hey, what happened? Uh, that people understood, you know, on a visceral level, what that was about. But I don't, you know, I don't feel a sense of collective guilt. I don't believe in collective yeah. guilt. I think, if anything, you know, we were taken in by, uh, you know, the promises and lies of, of the, the capitalist system as it now occurs, as it now exists, and those types of things. And uh, I feel that all this talk about greedy geezers and boomers are the problem, uh, deliberately or whether it's intentional or not, distracts people from the struggle we com we face in common. And right. uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Right, yeah, I mean, I think that, and you know, it's a shame because, because like, uh, you know, but by, by castigating all, all boomers as, you know, out of touch or whatever, I think that millennials lose this great perspective and these kind of historical lessons that, that we could reap from, from that era that, that, that you lived through. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, it's particularly interesting, like it, what, what you were saying about possibility and feeling that, that sense of possibility. Like, I think, uh, you know, I've noticed that for the most part, the type of, um, you know, fictional narratives that are, they're pop. So what I mean by that is like sort of the novels and films and TV shows that a lot of my generation consumes and really likes are dystopian. Right. So I, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, some people argue that that's kind of, uh, a trap, right? Like that, like that actually, if, if, if you, if you always are sort of inhaling these negative messages about the future that, you know, the idea that it's going to be bad and horrible, it, it'll become impossible for you to imagine a positive alternative future. And what's so interesting about like the counterculture generation that you were part of is that the rock music was, you know, it, like the, the, the rock music and, um, like the, the fiction and, and film and arts were all, all suggested this, this great possibility, this kind of like, positive vision of the future, this utopian vision of the future. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, that millennials forget that at our own, at our own peril. It's, it's a kind of unfortunate how hippies have been really reduced to a stereotype, right? Like we think of, I don't know, flowery dresses and people flashing the peace sign or something like that. But uh, we don't think about the actual way that people thought about the world back then, the, the, the kind of 
you know, how people found hope and possibility and saw this really open-ended, possibly positive future. And actually, RJ, I, sh- I want to ask you um, what you think of this. Like, so I didn't go this far in my article, but there's a lot of people who think that, you know, one of the reasons that um, the 60s didn't lead to a great economic transformation, didn't lead to a sort of more progressive, um, I don't know, global economic order, um, was because in the United States particularly, the hippie movement wasn't super tied to labor, whereas in Europe, the counterculture movements, like in France, there was a big general strike in, I believe, 68, and part of it was because all the student movements and all the young activists were uh, working sort of in concert with the labor movement, but that didn't happen in the United States, and so the kind of, you know, counterculture ideals were were not tied to structural things. It was like, you know, open-mindedness and, and I don't know, this sort of, you know, humanism, but it, it wasn't tied to anything structural that um, that could possibly transform the economic order, uh, which which is is why, I, you know, which is what what some theorists believe is why we sort of just ended up into the neoliberal morass that characterized, you know, the late seventies onward to now. So I guess I'm curious what you think of that. Like, did you did you feel growing up and living in that time that that you felt positive about the future, but maybe that people weren't that you, your peers weren't totally articulating this this kind of like actual structural critique? Yeah, no, I think absolutely. I felt that at the time and I feel that now. I should say, by the way, uh, before we go any further, that anybody who is alive at that time who might have been objectively described by a a third party observer as a hippie would have vehemently objected to using the term hippie and would never have used the term hippie to describe themselves. Uh, it was always something, a freak or something else, you know. That, yeah, that, that it was, so it was a slur like hipster is now. Yeah, yeah, and we the word freak was appropriated uh, because it obviously had, you know, very negative connotations for someone who did not meet normative ex- expectations, right? Mm-hmm. So that was adopted as a term for what others might call hippie because it was kind of like a, a, a conscious rejection of... Uh, of those normative values. Uh, But uh, that said, I mean, hippies, fine, whatever. But uh, I I think, yes, I I, I agree 100%. I mean, I was always pretty political in my analysis. And a a lot of people were, of course. But the vast majority, there was more of a kind of generalized, uh, almost euphoric, as you say, optimism and utopianism Mm -hmm without an understanding of uh, the immense structural uh, obstacles that remained in place. And I think even those of us, most of us, and I would certainly include myself in this, who did understand that, uh, failed to consider just how profound those obstacles would be and how inventive uh, yeah. and creative the forces we were up against would be not only in opposing us, but in co-opting us and our ideas and our yeah. imagery and our art and our work. And that, uh, unpacking that, you know, would be uh, fascinating work uh, for a lot of us to engage in, particularly because as the millennial generation looks for its own uh, patterns of rebellion and change, and I think is beginning to find some very interesting ones, I right. suspect that the same forces will deploy in similar ways again. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so basically the, what I took away from your piece on, on boomers and millennials was that one, you were saying that there was a lot for millennials to take away from the history of the boomer generation that they might find useful. And two, maybe that an alliance of some kind, uh, would be valuable to both groups. Is that, am I right about the latter part as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that there's so much, um, that millennials can learn both from the movement building that was happening in the time and, um, also just from the experience of living through such a, such a pivotal moment in history. Um, and also, you know, as you, as you alluded to, so not to repeat the same mistakes, but, I mean, mistakes is kind of a harsh word because the truth is that it, it, to some extent, the counterculture, the, the boomers succeeded in, in making a world, you know, like where a lot of liberal social values reign supreme. I mean, you know, we, we live in sort of dark times 
politically and economically, like in terms of just sort of having ever more authoritarian political systems and economic systems around the world. But I don't think, you know, anyone would argue that, that, that we don't like that. That's, there's been so much social change in the last, um, uh, I guess 50 years since, since the sixties, um, that like, you know, um, it's just been so many civil rights victories in, you know, since, since then from, uh, like same sex marriage becoming normalized, like pot being legalized all over the United States and other drugs, um, to like the way that the work workplaces have changed to be so much more casual, um, things like the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. which are sort of, you know, partial un unfulfilled social movements. Um, but, you know, like when I, so my parents are boomers, as I said, and I think they would, you know, self have self-identified as sort of hippies or counterculture. And my, my dad is always saying, you know, he's always saying he's so, he never would have thought that pot would be legal in his lifetime. He never, he, he wouldn't have imagined that, that same-sex marriage would have been legal in his, in his lifetime. It just seems so far off back in the 60s and, um, uh, you know, the, the the boomers were very successful in that regard, even if they were sort of you know um, unsuccessful in uh, aiding any kind of economic transformation towards uh, a more you know progressive uh, like less authoritarian economic system. Yeah, and I think there's you know un unpacking that is really interesting. It could be partially. Uh, because the economic interests that control the country are a lot more interested in preserving their economic power than cultural right. power. And I remember my uncle once, and then we can switch to the, your, your book, which I want to talk about, but I remember my uncle once taking me to a very expensive restaurant when I was about 17 or 18, and I had shoulder length hair, and he gave me a jacket to wear, but I had jeans with holes in them, and sandals, right. and a t-shirt, and an earring, and you know, and the waiters, it was clear, all assumed that I was like this very wealthy kid, which I yeah. wasn't. I was middle class. But because, you know, that sort of stylistic and cultural and lifestyle uh, um, aspect of the, the hippie movement, if you want to call it that, was embraced by all the rich kids. I, you know, yeah. They all got high and, you know, grew their hair and didn't care, you know, were open about sexuality and those types of things, but right. I don't think they would have come down to the local left-wing meeting and shared their wealth, yeah. you know, given their wealth to the group. So sure. uh, I think that's what we're seeing now, and I think the question now is how to revive that utopian spirit or that spirit that says right. that real change is possible and that communal and community activity is the route to get there, how to revive that while at the same time uh, applying it uh, more broadly to issues of economic as well as social justice. Right, totally. And you know, and I'll, I'll tell you, RJ, something really interesting is that um, a lot of the, you know, momentum and ideals of, you know, the counterculture were absorbed into, you um, the tech industry and a lot of the people who went into tech in Silicon Valley, which is a big, a big part of what my book is about. Um, that, um, you know, like, like the, I think the, the fact that Silicon Valley exists in the Bay area and the fact that, you know, like one of the sort of centers of counterculture and hippie movements was in the Bay area is not totally a coincidence. Like there was this idea back in the sixties and even earlier that, um, computer technology was going to free us, was going to like, like a, a lot of early internet pioneers and net, networking pioneers generally, not necessarily people associated with the official sort of internet, but pe people who saw the, this promise in computers and were involved in it thought that having these, these sort of global network computers would, would allow humans to communicate in this way that was free of like government intervention or oversight sure. that would lead to revolution, you know, would lead to some sort of whether, you know, like sort of violent or nonviolent, literal or sort of figurative revolution. And that was a common belief. And a lot of those ideas, a lot of these counterculture and utopian, especially utopian ideas, got totally absorbed into Silicon Valley. And nowadays, a lot of people of my generation, um, you know, they look at the world and like, they, 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 they think to themselves, well, like, you know, um, there's no hope for like, this is the, the best we can do in terms of economic systems. So, so you know, there's no hope for change, but I can work in tech, which is this great utopian thing, and we'll change the world. 
And so, you know, they go and work in the tech industry and sort of often discover when they get there that actually that there's nothing really utopian about it. It's an industry like any other, and it and it is able to recruit and profit on these young people by by offering this kind of like like branding or the marketing that stems from the counterculture era. So that's that's actually you know interestingly how this article is sort of connected to the research that I did um, in writing a People's History of Silicon Valley. Well, that's absolutely, it absolutely makes sense. I was actually I was in the Bay Area during a lot of that time and mm. um, uh, remember the utopian talk around programming and I was a yeah. programmer at one point and, you know, I did a bunch of different things. And yeah. uh, that, that actually got me into the corporate world where I wound up for 20 years. But, um, but uh, so I remember, for example, there was a, a whole earth store and inspired by the whole earth catalog and it was very yes. hippie and counterculture and i went down there and i was thinking of working there and they had a meeting and i went and you know everybody had long hair and looked like right. you know hippies and so on but the first thing they said was well we're not allowed to tell you this anymore because you know the man came around and said it was <laughs> illegal but the best way to get a job here is work here for free for a couple weeks and like if we if we if we get along if we you know if the yeah. vibes are right we'll hire you but of course you know the man with his rules in other words and i immediately said okay these guys are ripping off working people i want nothing to do with it and i left but right. but that was the ethos the right wing the combination of right right wing libertarianism mm -hmm. with uh the the the, op, the belief in what technology can do that was sort of like one of the early manifestations of it and uh so i remember that well and uh, uh i think that i don't know uh, i guess to pivot to your book uh mm -hmm. the people's history of of silicon valley uh i think it's very interesting to look at uh that as a co-option or co-optation of yeah. uh uh, of a utopian impulse for what some would argue were, were cynical ends. You know, I've had Yasha yeah. Levine on the show talking about his book, Surveillance Valley. Right. And Yasha, you know, says it was a military project from the beginning yeah. and there were conscious decisions to turn it over to the private sector. Uh, you right. do a great job in your book of talking about how this, uh, this Silicon Valley uh, empire affects all the people who feed it and are manipulated by it. Um, but what do you think about the, first of all, starting with the origin story, uh, both the utopian dream and, and, you know, from what I hear from people in that industry, they really believed the u utopian stuff at the same time that they stepped into the role right. with enormous ease of being the sort of railroad barons of the 21st century. So I'm yeah. curious, what's your thought on the utopianism versus the opportunism that created the Silicon right. Valley. Well, I mean, so I think if if my book has sort of a, a a main thrust or thesis, I mean, it's 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 definitely an overview of um, like kind of you know a history of Silicon Valley from a workers' perspective or people who were affected by it. But I think one of the main themes is to kind of like deflate this idea that anything is different about the tech industry compared to other industries, the candy industry or the soda industry. Um, and that sounds like, I don't know, you know, that, that may sound like a, like just an easy thing to do, but actually it's not because the tech industry is, is, is different in some ways of how it's branded. And one of the, one of the things about it is, so first of all, it's name, like technology. Uh, the idea of technology, you know, like, I mean, the, the tech industry, technology is a broad term, right? I mean, like um, the car industry makes technology. The soda industry makes soda and vending machine technology. Um, the the food industry makes food packaging. All of these are forms of technology, but only the only Silicon Valley gets to benefit from having that name in its title. And that's actually, I don't think it's not even intentional, but it's a very clever uh, branding opportunity for them because it, it because the idea of technology in our mind is sort of like associated with the ideas of the future and of progress, especially right. So like because of this sort of you know. In, in a lot of people's minds, they think of progress when they think of tech. The, I, the industry to them sounds like this is progress. This is where progress mm -hmm. lives in our society. Progress stems from Silicon Valley. It flows from Silicon Valley, right? So that's that's a super powerful, uh, uh, you know, form of branding for for 
for the tech industry itself just to have, right? What right. they actually, if you look at what people in the tech industry, what businesses in the tech industry do, it's mostly, it, you're either an ad agency, you're either selling ads, that's what most, right. you know, like social media and search engine companies do. Um, or you're, you're maybe involved in, in um, some hardware production for like microchips and, and such. But those microchips end up in all kinds of things. They don't just end up in computers and phones. I mean, like, um, you know, like my, my watch has microchips in it. Like um, uh, clocks in the wall have microchips in them. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not just something that's limited to computers and um, phones and such. The other, the other the, so then my second point that I, I would say is that, is that um, before Silicon Valley even existed as it, as it does nowadays before the microcomputer boom started in the, in the 70s, arguably, um, the tech industry also had a built-in PR apparatus. It had this whole, this whole history of science fiction, right? And science fiction kind of like unintentionally right. uh, plays into ideas of what Silicon Valley is and what it does and has a strange reflexive relationship with it. So like a lot of technology, uh, it's computer technology specifically, um, first appeared in sci-fi. And a lot of people who work in the tech industry really like sci-fi or read too much sci-fi or sort of become <laughs> obsessed with it. Like, like Jeff Bezos just uh, a couple days ago, you know, had this really elaborate pronouncement of how he wants to have humans living in these giant cities in space. I mean, it was absurd. He's, a billi he's like a, he just, you know, the hubris of being like, oh, this is how humans are going to live in the future because I decided it. But he got that idea from all kinds of sci-fi books that have readied us for this vision of how humans might live in space in the future. And in the same sense, uh, you know, like you see this reflexive relationship a lot with, with Silicon Valley and science fiction, like um, the iPad was something that, you know, Star Trek depicted on um, TV first and the idea of the, the internet and of network computers and of computers you could talk to, all of those were science fiction ideas. So because sci-fi is a utopian genre generally, I mean, to some, to some degrees, not all sci-fi is all utopian, but it's always about, you know, it's, it's almost always about futuristic, uh, how people live in the future with an emphasis on the technology that allows them to live that way. And just the existence of that genre in film and in fiction and novels uh, is great for Silicon Valley. I mean, they get, they get billions and billions of dollars of free, free PR every year because of this whole history of this genre that has become you know, so associated with them. And I think like, you know, like you were saying before, a lot of people read sci-fi and then they're like, oh, maybe like I want to go into tech because I want to be, you know, I want to, I want to, I don't know, help contribute to this utopian idea of the future that I learned about from reading sci-fi. And make a ton of money. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, which is, a, so, you know, we have, so they, but the, in order to do that, they're, they're, they're not really following the movie they're living, right? Because they're, right. Um, and, and I do, you know, I have a good friend who's part of that whole world and, and he's, but he's disconnected. He, he, he's aware enough, very aware, uh, aware enough to say that the business plans of today's Silicon Valley, uh, corporations are evil and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but he's friends with Zuckerberg and everybody. And, and I said, well, but then your friends are doing evil stuff. Another friend of mine puts sure. this even better that, you know, well, if their business plans are evil there, he can't go there. You know I mean? It's kind of like, it's a cognitive leap that people involved with the Silicon Valley can't make, uh, except sure. I guess, you know, we've, we've had done episodes on the new young Silicon Valley left and everything, but, but by and large, uh, there's this sentimental attachment to, to this utopian myth you talk about, although it's changing. I have to say it's changing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wrote a piece five years ago for Salon about regulating big tech. I wasn't even mm -hmm. yet at the point of breaking them up. And people thought I was insane. I mean, it was just, yeah. no, this is the dream. Right. This is the future. There's a lot more action now to try to reform uh, and that's why I think there's an audience for your book, uh, People's yeah. History of Silicon Valley, because people want to know what the real life implication of this is and they want to do something about it. But maybe I'm being too utopian by believing that. I don't know. What do you think? No, I mean, I think, uh, it think it's, it's amazing how fast the attitudes towards Silicon Valley have changed. Like really right as I was publishing this book, it came out in, I think, uh, November of last year, um, there was like this sort of title shift a negative PR, like like Silicon Valley was just sort of 
the the whole the whole industry was just kind of bombarded with all with with negative PR. A lot of it stemming from you know public discussions about uh, social media and its effect on global politics and and politics in, in the United States in the 2016 election. Um, 2018 has been called you know Facebook's worst year. Just there was something like an average of at least one public crisis at the company every month, some scandal at the company every mm -hmm. single month. Um, so, I mean, you know, with anything, like this, this is actually sort of like a common thing. It's not, it's not just innate to the tech industry, but every time there's some, um, every time communications or uh, there's sort of a new, every time communications moves to a new media or um, like there's new industries created, it takes a while for people to understand how to regulate them. I mean, like a lot of the terminology and the things you know, the, the terminology related to how the tech industry works or how social media works or how, um, what the internal mechanisms of this company look like. I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, it wasn't public knowledge or it wasn't well understood by people until more recently. Um, and then, I mean, also, you know, because politicians tend to be of an older generation, you know, they may not have as much experience um, using the types of tools that likely need regulation or, or using the type of services that you know, younger people are sort of pretty much believe or think need to be broken up. Uh, things like, you know, Facebook. There's, you know, right now there's like a growing movement to break up Facebook. And, and Facebook. Elizabeth Warren is proposing that, if I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, she's very big on tech regulation. She seems to understand it relatively well. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But it, for, to put, put this in context for folks, I would encourage them to read your book because uh, I think it's great, very informative, and I love the way it kind of ties together the human implications of it from workers in the Congo right. extracting the minerals all the way to people uh, who are using it. So I strongly recommend your book. And, uh, Thank you. And the title again, let me make sure I get it exactly right, or why don't you give us the title of the book? Sure, the, the full title is a People's History of Silicon Valley, How the Tech Industry it's, Exploits Workers, Erodes Privacy, and Undermines Democracy. And um, you, can get it, you can get it anywhere. Um, you know, any, any bookseller will be able to order it, whether you want to order it um, online or from you know, your, local, your local bookstore. Yeah. Okay, so good. Press publisher. I don't have a copy to hold up because it's on my iPad. But yeah. uh, I, I, there it is. I also oh, yes. possess it. Um, I, you can get it as an e-book, too, I should say. The yeah. fitting the sort of topic. Right, absolutely. The medium is the message. Uh, so Keith A. Spencer, uh, author of People's History of Silicon Valley and writer and editor for Salon, uh, thanks for all of the insights and thanks for coming on the program. Of course, yeah. Always great to be here, RJ.